Hey, welcome in everybody to this edition of True Philadelphian Sportscast, the grittiest take. As you can see, we're joined here by Pirlo Wisdom again. It's great to have you, Pirlo. How you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, sir. Being on this podcast and all talking about hockey, how could life be better? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so let's get right into some hockey talk. We're going to be talking about a lot of the uh, different awards and who we think should win some of the awards today and then we'll probably save some potentially because mm-hmm. Steele's going to be on a podcast with us in the future so we don't uh pun intended steal all of his uh fire so you know um yeah. but we can start with the Calder who is an interesting race because I love the I love the two defensemen but then when you really look into the stats of the 30 goal scorer Kubalik he obviously makes it a little bit close between the defensemen, but I would pick between the two defensemen. You have Hughes, Quinn Hughes of the Canucks, Cal McCarr of the Avalanche, who, of course, stepped right into last year's playoffs and looked like a veteran, and then Dominic Kubalik of the Blackhawks. So out of that grouping, where are you leaning towards there? Because, like I said, when you look at some of these guys' stats, especially Kubalik's uh, – he makes it actually closer than I initially thought. Because at first I was like, 30-goal scorer, that's great as a rookie, so he has to be up there. And then when I looked, um, his uh, the, the amount of time his team possessed the puck with him on the ice was about the same as Kane this year. So I was like, okay, so that's, uh, that's, a, pretty good, um, that's a pretty good stat to look at, too, the fact that uh, he had a pretty good time of possessions, about even time of possession numbers, which is kind of – um, so that, um, but I wouldn't give it to him. So, but I would just say, and that made it closer for me. I would give it, you know, who I give it to. I love Cal McCarr. I mean, that confidence, how can you, how can you, uh, like when he backs up that confidence of stepping right into a playoffs and basically scoring in a millisecond, <laughs> uh, to put together this season, I feel like that's why I give it to him where it's almost unfair to Quinn Hughes. Um, but it's just the way it is because he stepped in last year, did great, and then impressed me more this year where Hughes just didn't have that last year factor, which is probably why my voting would go to him. So, I think that definitely kill, uh, is, is definitely plays a part, that Makara has that playoff and uh, like just has that already ha- has already rolled into from last year, so it's like more of a window – of of uh, uh to to see how good he is like you have more of a he he's consi- can did it for longer is what i'm trying to say uh he's did it for longer and he just looked i don't know i love quinn hughes i think he's a fantastic he reminds me of fowler in a way but maybe even more with off more offense than fowler mm-hmm. but mccarr he just seems to control things more. Do you, do you, there seems to be a yeah. level of control to that guy. That it's like he commands your eyes to, to, to go on him all the time. He's got that Drew doubtiness about him where yeah. when he's on the ice, you're like, oh, there's he, there he is. Yeah. You know what well, I mean? he even did that as a he, – that's why it was so remarkable because – you have guys like McKinnon, you got Landis Cog, you got uh, Radnan, you got all those guys on the Avalanche, and then you have in the postseason your eyes getting drawn to a youngster rookie in Cal McCarr because of how well he jumped into last year's postseason. Now, I must say because plus minus is um, good when it's ridiculous on one side and the other to sway things. When it's kind of in the middle, it's not always the best. Sometimes the CF percentage is the best to say how the possession time is when players are on the ice. Hughes and McCarr, if you're going to vote based off of how their team possesses the puck on the ice, is literally almost smack even. One's a 52.7 in Hughes CF percentage, and the other's a 52.8. So you literally couldn't vote on that. You would be like, well, their team literally possesses the puck the same with these guys on the ice. I can't, that doesn't help me at all. Um, So, like... You would just have to vote on your wits at that point. Uh, you wouldn't even be able to go. Like, a lot of their analytical stats are pretty close. So if you're someone that votes on that, these two guys, you kind of just have to go with your wits on uh, who you think should get it. 
Yeah, I mean, 50 points in 57 games for, for a 21 year old kid. I mean, mm-hmm. For McCarr, I, I, I like, I love you. I like them both. I mean, everybody loves them both, right? I, I just. Oh yeah, I don't think anybody dislikes any of those rookies. I mean, I, I would throw Cooper. McCarr is a guy that's going to not only be on fire offensively and he's solid defensively as well. So is Quinn Hughes. I also see a guy who could be a captain of a team. He just demands attention, this kid. There's something about him. That's the best I can say. There's just something about that guy that draws your eyes to him as soon as he gets on the ice. And I think people look, he's a guy that people are going to look up to. Um, yeah, I, I, it's you know, like you said, it is very unfair because if it, Quinn Hughes was in most any other years, he'd be the landslide. You know what I mean? Well, there's sure. also there's also something to be said. If you didn't have defensemen step up like McCarr and Hughes, having a 30 goal scorer in some years probably would have won the Calder too. In a Absolutely. Kubelik. Um, that's why he's a guy I think is going to be fun to watch, especially because certain guys now, Patrick Kane, I don't think is ever going to decline very quickly at all. Um, but certain guys, as they get older, Kubelik's going to continue to play on top lines in Chicago. He can consistently probably be 25 and up. I don't know if you're going to go back-to-back 30 goals in the first two years of your career. You might be able to if you're that good, but uh, that sometimes you dip in your second year a bit, and then you kind of come back. So all three of those rookies are very interesting and very fun um, players to watch. I didn't check out uh, Kubelik's – I never thought about checking out his shooting percentage. I mean, I wonder how – you know, maybe a lucky he was, but I did watch him on the ice. He kind of reminds me of a young. He did have three game-winning goals, though. So he also came up. Uh, I didn't even, I didn't even notice that. Um, he so kind of reminds me of a young Hosa, actually. Uh, trying to see if his shoes. Wa- watching him on the ice, he kind of reminds me of a young Hosa, and uh, um, just by the eye test that I see, I think he'll consistently, like you said, score in that category or area. Um, but I, I never thought about checking the shooting percentage. He's a solid player. Um, he's also older, isn't he not? He's an older rookie as well. And I think that kind of works against him a little bit as well. But uh, just being... Yeah, Kubel, it's 24, yeah. 24 years old. So he's an older rookie. It's not very likely. I, I would actually go as far as to say, I, I, I think I would have rather seen Fox there. But the NHL really just seems to don't seems to, I don't know they seem like to always want to even everything out all the time. Kubalik is is a fantastic player, deserves honors. But I, I liked Fox's possession. I like Fox's overall the way he was his use. I'm assuming. Don't you think it could have been because they didn't want to get bland with three defensemen? Yeah. The, so, I th- yeah, they they wanted to have a different. Uh, they didn't want to have three defensemen. Yeah, which doesn't really make much sense. But honestly, I think Fox can be in the same category as Makar and yeah. Hughes as level of defensemen. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah, because yeah, they mean, showed the stat screen. Obviously, you only uh, we'll get to the Norris later, but you only nominate three. But when they showed it on the like five and through. McCarr, because of his stats, was ranked pretty high from the metro from some of the stats, and so was uh, so was Adam Fox. So those yeah. are, that would that would make you think if he would be ranked in the top ten of that voting from some, he would be in the Rookie of the Year nomination. But yeah. uh, it is what it is. But also, I had an update um, on my phone, which is good news. Uh, Bleacher Report said only two positive COVID-19 cases out of 2,618 tests to more than 800 players since Phase 3 began in the NHL. So they've been uh, doing a lot better since Phase 3. But now uh, we could move on to – this is an interesting one because obviously one guy has – well, one guy has – um dominator like stats just not in the amount of games uh played is a uh, hell buck but where do you peg the Vezina at because Tuka Rask like I said has absolutely ridiculous almost like Hashik X stat but played in 41 games and then I want to say Connor Hellbuck played in 50 high 50s like 58 
So, so where would you peg that? That's a tough one. Uh, we I, put. Sorry, you got, yeah. Well, uh, where, I got Hellebuck. You got Hellebuck because yeah. he was the carrying a uh, weight of. Yeah, maybe not in. Maybe it's not. Maybe not fair. I guess none of these things always. But there's always reasoning behind it. Uh, is Tuka Rask going to have those stats behind that defense? Maybe, but the fact is, Hellebuck did have those stats behind that defense. And let's face it, that defense on paper looks pretty poopy. Uh, not to mention watching them in on the most nights. I think Tuka Rask had much more help from their overall team. It doesn't really help Tuka too much that he's got his his the, one of the centers on his team is up for the Selkie, right? So you you already have one of the best defensive centers of our generation playing for you. Unfortunately, it doesn't bode well for Vesna's for uh, a goaltender. It's just the way that we just talked about how it come to I think a lot of ways of the league thinks or people think for that matter just human nature human nature would say that winnipeg's defense that's and true numbers is the insane. reason that's a good point the reason i see tuca winning it though is because of like i said even though he only played 41 games he has the dominator like numbers and i think like you talked about before our podcast some guys that are getting older i believe Tuka's what 32 now let me go check uh tuca yeah tuca rask is 32 now and he hasn't won the Vesna since 2013 14. But so, he did win one. So. But and he so won. So did Hellebuck, though. So did Hellebuck. Yeah. So I would think since Hellebuck's more in the peak of his career, if they look at that, they might go, well, Rass might not have as much money time to win the Vesna just in case uh, he has some tiring or whatever. Some goaltenders last very long, others dwindle out after they're 35. So you never know with goalies. Um, maybe they'll give it to him because obviously looking at his stats, even though it's only 41 games, he was, he had a 212 and a 929 save percentage. So yeah. that's, that's, um, now Hellbuck, Hel- stats, yeah. yeah, Hellbuck had a 922 and a 257. So he had also very ridiculous stat, but, um, and then Hellbuck, I don't think help according to, uh, Hockey reference, Hellbuck uh, hasn't won the Vesna yet. I think you were thinking of when he could have won in 17-18, but he came in second because he went 44-11. and 11. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know what? That was I think that year I wanted – I had him win it too. Maybe that's why I thought he won. But, uh, yeah, that for that in mind, I, I think that if there's a year that Hellebuck – I just I if I, I just think with that defense, him putting up those kind of numbers and just watching him, Winnipeg doesn't even come close to the playoffs without Hellebuck. And Pekka won it, yeah. Like so, every, it's easy to say that everybody says, well, of course you have a goaltender, but I'm like, if you change Hellebuck for 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 most of the goaltenders in the league, they're likely not even coming close. Like I really, he was fantastic. No, that's true. Pekka Rene won it in um. 17 and uh, yeah. 18 because he went 42 and 13 with a 231 and a 927. So that makes a little bit of sense because he had a 231, which was a little bit better than Hellbuck's 236, and a 927, which was a tad better than Hellbuck's 924. So right. that's not that's not really a bad thing. Before we move on there, I would like to mention something about uh, Vasilevsky and. Uh, <laughs> his season that he had uh i congratulate the nhl for giving bass the the opportunity here because it it's not something the nhl does very often is tampa bay switched their whole style of play the first two like it was a difficult transition for a goaltender you know as a goaltender right and uh a lot of people were asking, what's wrong with Vass? And I remember back and I was like, there's nothing wrong with Vass. They're switching their system and he's like, has to adjust to that. And he's doing fantastic in consideration. So I'm actually glad they gave him some props here. Mm-hmm. No, he did really good. He had a 917 that went down, I think, because of what you said, a system change. Um, mm-hmm. 35, you can never snuff at a 35 and uh, 14. Um, Record. That's a, that's an absolute and record shouldn't always mean but when record is that ridiculous, then that should mean something a little 
little bit, uh, especially yeah. when you have a two five six, which is right around your career average um, of your save percentage, and your nine seventeen with, like you said, the system chain is only two point two below or point zero two below his uh, normal save percentage. So you have uh, the thing that obviously hurts him is he won last year's Vesna. So yeah. Yeah. I don't think he's going to win this year because his numbers don't blow you off of the charts like Hellbuck and Took potentially do. So that kind of hurts him when he won, obviously, in, la- in last season. Mm-hmm. So and you got Hedman and you got a lot of great player, defensive players on that team and all that kind of stuff like that. But I, I'm just glad I'm, I'm just saying that like those I, I don't know where there are any there was I'm, I think there's probably better numbers out there. But uh, I, I was really impressed with fast season. Like to me, it was pretty fantastic to be able to go through that change and, and still put up those kind of numbers in an off like a team that was switching to a, a, a different type of system. So, no, I, that, yeah. I do. Com- I completely agree that he should. Uh, he's a guy that easily um, deserved the third nomination. I do think he probably wouldn't have got it if. Uh, Darcy Kemper stayed healthy, though. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't think Vasilevsky would have been in the Vezina um, nominees this year, but. No. But um, we can move on now to a guy that's obviously in your, where you reside now in Alberta, in Leon Dreisaitl, who's in the Ted Lindsay, and obviously tomorrow when they announce should also be in the heart conversation and is. I mean, I think we can pretty much say he's going to be nominated for the heart trophy because that would be a sin if he somehow did. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that would be absolutely a disgrace to the sport. Um, you would, uh, so you have Dreisaitl, McKinnon, and Panarin. And I think this might be the year for the MVP voted by the players, for those that don't know, is the Ted Lindsay. Uh, that it might actually be easy to pick it because normally the players' minds are hard to pick, but because Crosby got injured, Crosby's usually in the Ted Lindsay nomination. And like it went to Price, normally the players go with the guy that has it, that has that great career, and they know he's still good. He's just on a not well, Crosby's on a great team, but they gave it to Price because he's not on his great team. But Crosby's still doing his thing, and he did good this year. Problem is, he didn't do great overall when he came back because of core muscle surgery. He just did good on the offensive end, so they didn't put him in there. But that's why I think this year almost makes the award the easiest it's almost ever been to pick the player's mind, potentially, because if they look at it from your guy's perspective, Nichols, Iserman, excuse me, um, Gretzky and Lemieux have had 150 point seasons at one point at this stretch. They said it was on NHL network the other day at one point this season before their stats went more to today's game. Um, dry settle and McDavid and then McDavid of course got injured. We're both on pace to potentially be on those seasons. And then their stats went to more normalizing, but that's also because other players like Yamamoto came up and stepped up scoring and you had other guys, Cassie and played well. That's because they didn't have to do everything and guys stepped up more around them as well. So that's why I would think for me, it's going to go to dry cycle. Cause if I'm a player and I look at that, that's only happened with four other players other than a guy that also, I can't remember his name right now, but somebody did it in the World Hockey Association with the Norkies. But other than that, so there's five people, but there's four people in the NHL. So, yeah, I think it's going to go to Dry Settle as well. Um, but if if for some reason it went with Nick, went went, uh, I personally, personally, I think it's a wash. I can't decide between McKinnon and Dry I. I loved McKinnon led that Colorado team extremely well. Uh, he was it's just, they're both fantastic to watch. I just, I love them both. And um, I'm an Oilers fan. So for me to say that says a lot, but for all the reasons you just said, if you're looking at what the players are going to think, I agree. I think dry will be the pick will be the one there. Yeah. 
because I just think if you vote as a player, the pace they were on at a certain point and the pace that those guys have a chance to be on matches um, in recent, in the years coming, I mean, matches the Crosby and Malkin tandem that was made for you. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you're already seeing it. I think that's going to get awarded. Dreisaitl pulled a, if you want to call a Crosby or Malkin, whatever one you want to call him, but whenever one gets injured, the other one goes, don't worry, buddy, I got you, and then just turns into even a better version of themselves. And this is the year that we really saw Dreisaitl do that uh, when McDavid went down, so that's huge for him. I think that's going to that's what I think is going to clinch it for him with the Lindsay and also when we see his name come out for the Hart Trophy. But that's going to come out tomorrow, what those nominees are. So I completely agree with you on that. Um, this one is one we already kind of talked about on a podcast, so we'll just go through it quickly. But the uh, Jack Adams, I think personally, I think it's between A.V. and Torch. Uh, I think Cassidy's a great head coach, but I kind of said it in my video on my uh, YouTube channel, Sports Fanatic News, about the uh, the thing. Um, he got in there because you're going to put the president's trophy coach in the Jack Adams discussion, most likely. So no matter what, he's going to get in there. It's not like he coached – like he coached good, but he had a, one of the best rosters. So if you coach bad with that team – then you just shouldn't like be coaching because that just sh- like that just shows you can't really you're not really cut out to coach in the ho- in the National Hockey League. Like so, Washington? yeah, <laughs> but um, but that's why I personally believe it's it's a toss between AV and Torch because Torch obviously brought a team that you didn't expect to absolutely like impress you. You didn't even expect to make the playoffs because. They didn't even have starting goaltending potentially going into this year. They had no idea what they were doing. And then Corpy stepped up before injury. And then Merz Lincolns went like eight and two or whatever. Like he went like on like a ridiculous stretch, whatever it was. And like he played amazing. So both of those guys played absolutely amazing for them. But then here, AV finally got a roster that we knew had talent and capability to actually play to their talent and capability and grow the youngsters' talents and capabilities, which is something that Hackstall, because he wasn't ready as a coach, was very unable to do. So um, that's that's why it's a very big toss-up. I um, personally, because of not even bias, but I would lean AV because – Selkie nomination too. Couturier's always got snubbed. And finally, in AV system that really moves the defense to the offense, he finally got in the Selkie nomination. So that's a big help of, I think, also Coach Elaine Vigneault, Provorov having an absolutely magnificent season coming back and really starting to obviously reestablish himself again after a down season that I don't think anybody was really worried about overly worried about at least I wasn't I thought so uh he really had a great year Sanheim had his best year Meyer I think all those things having the youngsters which showed how he's grown from each of his spots because he wasn't the best with that in Vancouver he got good at that with uh the Rangers and then has really been good at balancing everything with us uh that's why I would give it to him but it would probably be by like and this and even though I'm a Flyers fan it would probably be by like that much of a mark because, like, it wouldn't be by a big margin. Uh, I love A.V. Uh, you know that. Uh, but I get, I, it's not a small margin for me. Tortorella just did stupid things with that team. I'm a capper for a living. B-Pal picks, if you want to check it out. It's pretty cool. People make lots of money. But I'll tell you, I lost money. I love Tortorella. And I still underrate him all the time. <laughs> I've, I lost money betting against Tortorella's Columbus Blue Jackets this year, probably more than any other team. And uh, um, I, I, on, the, on the opposite side, talking about Philadelphia, I made money a lot with Philadelphia because uh, a lot of people undervalued the lineup that they had and AV's uh, impact on that team was 
fantastic. Um, so I, I bet on him a lot. But he just keeps on, uh, Tortorella keeps on blowing my mind constantly. Like he just keeps on doing things more. Every time I think, okay, this is it. It's no way. Not even towards him. Boom. He does it again. Does it again. Does it again. I think he's the greatest coach of this generation. Honestly, I really do. And that is saying a lot when you're talking about wonderful guys like A.D., who we've talked to at Great Lengths. Um, I go with Tortorella on this. Um, I'm, could A.B. do the same thing, Tortorella, with that lineup? Possibly, but he didn't have the opportunity. Um, I, I'm talking about Philadelphia and what A.B. did. What he did with Hayes. Oh, what a – in one year. I mean, Hayes was always very good. He was going to be a good two-way guy. But with A.B.'s guidance, he looked close to Selkie level. Like, you've almost got two Selkie-level centers in Philadelphia right now with Hayes and Coots. Like, amazing uh, what, uh, what he did with that kid. And uh, so I give him lots of props, but I got to go with Torts. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, they're both some of the best motivators in the game, too, from a different stylistic point, obviously. Uh, A.V. doesn't get to the red in the face, yeah. about to pass out and die. Yeah. yelling of John Tortorella. Yeah, Tortorella is yeah. definitely uh, not conventional, that's for sure. No. Uh, Tortorella looks like he's about to have a heart attack sometimes. Maybe he's not like, actually all that conventional. No, either. no, he's other, not. On the other but side but on a different things. perspective, though. On like, the other not, side yeah, on the other side. A -V -A -V almost, he almost appears like he's too player-friendly but uh, in some ways, but uh, he's great, yeah. Great. So no. happy go like funny and all that kind of like Paul Maurice who I think yeah. didn't get enough props here. I think no, I believe I that. believe that as well. I think Paul Maurice Paul Maurice was one of the guys that I talked about when like I told you before the podcast Andrew and I for people I want to go back to check that out before we started doing videos. It's on Anchor, it's on Apple, it's on Spotify. We did on the grittiest take an NHL awards show pre before knowing all the nominees. And I brought up Paul Maurice because he should have got some credit. He was with a team. I didn't. You lost three of your defensemen before the season in Myers, Bufflin, and who was the other? Uh, <laughs> My I went Bufflin and let me think about where. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Oh, uh, Sherrod. Sherrod. Yeah, you're talking about it, yeah, it, Sherrod. it was him. Sherrod um, from Montreal. Yeah, but um. So you lost a bunch of guys, and there you just figured it out. And that's almost like being able to, like, how torts, not to the degree, but just, like, went, okay, yeah, this works for me. You you go here, let's throw you over there and put yeah. you here. And then it just somehow worked. Like, Nathan Gerby, of all people, if we're going go back to the Blue Jackets. Columbus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Columbus came back into the NHL and looked good. Yeah. Like, yeah. he actually looked like what people thought he could be when he got drafted because of his skill set. He was just obviously very short, but people thought because of his skill set, he could actually have been something, and it never really panned out. Torch yeah. made him look like he could actually be a decent player, maybe yeah. be a depth which, player, a fill-in player. Which, by the way, is the reason also why I think Hellebuck will win the Vesna. If... Because Maurice didn't get the vote, it, the, the, the look will be because Hellebuck was such a good goaltender, that takes That's the shine off Paul Maurice, right? So, And I, I think it's more to do with the fact, I think Hellebuck probably is as good as he is because Paul Maurice's system allowed for that to happen with that defense in front of him. It's always a give and take there. It's hard to judge which which is more valuable than the other. It all works together. But you're right. I mean, if you put A.B., Tortorella, Paul these guys are just absolute genius motivators and, 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 and stuff. Any one of them gets it. I'm not, I'm not going to argue too much. These guys are brilliant. <laughs> Who are you going to say? They're, they're all brilliant. No, all yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah there's, no, there's no point in uh, arguing. And no. now, now I'm speaking of um, how we talked about helpfulness to their goaltenders uh, earlier. Obviously, these guys are very helpful to their goaltender nominees for the Norris Trophy. 
Um, so that's between John Carlson of the Washington Capitals, Victor Hedman of the Tampa Bay Lightning, and then Oh, I like all of these guys, but this guy is just particularly one of my favorite players in the league, Roman Yossi of the Predators. Um, so uh, I think that pretty much gives away who I'm voting for. But uh, yeah. who would be uh, your uh, vote for the mm-hmm. North? Uh, you know, I, that's Carlson's numbers are like the best thing we've seen since like Paul Coffey days, right? And I love offensive players like that. He's not horrible defensively, too. People no, he up. finally stepped up this year. This has he, been his best year. He, he's not horribly def- horrible defensively. Uh, but, again, this is just looking on ice. Roman Yossi is another one of those guys that demands attention when he's on the mm-hmm. ice. He controls the game in such a way, defensively and offensively, in such a way where you're like, okay, what's Roman going to do now? You know? That's kind mm-hmm. of like the Makar thing, too. What's Makar going to do in this situation? Everybody's looking at what's back. In, and for the for Nashville, I think you could actually make a case because they made the playoffs for him getting the heart. Like, does that team even come close without Roman there? No, uh, they, yeah, they, uh, that's a good point because I was watching a uh, video. I forget if it was from TSN YouTube or Sportsnet's uh, YouTube, but – they were going over how Roman Yossi, if he wasn't that good for the Predators this year, they would have been nowhere because you had coaching issues uh, that he, as a leader of the team, helps keep everyone stabilized and together during all that. Then, obviously, Hines came in, did very well. Got him, he kept everybody doing their thing during that. That speaks volumes as well, so that is a very good um, point. That would, that would be um, very surprising to a lot of people, if you see the Hart Trophy nominees, say, Dreisaitl, Panarin, Yossi tomorrow, but – Or Pasternak, Dreisaitl. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, I mean, I didn't get – it doesn't matter about that. But, anyways, I'm going by what I just said. I would have to say that I would give it to Yossi. But I have a – I actually have a very difficult time doing it because Carlson's numbers were just so fantastic. He had such an amazing year. Yeah, and like although offensive numbers like that. I don't know if the league, the league likes to go with the points, right? They like to show off the offensive yeah. part of the game. So they may give it to Carlson. And but, uh, I mean, I'm not going to bitch about that really. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. I wouldn't, but um, I think, their point total is only 10 off and they both played the same amount of games. So the fact that Yossi controls both ends, uh, this is when, this is the year that Carlson has really, really, really showed that the best in his game. So that really does help him in the voting. But the fact that Yossi's been there, done that and has been doing it and also hasn't won a Norris, um, which that kind of pisses me off, but I'll let that go. Um, the, um, the uh, so I think this might be he's at the age of 30 as well. I think this might be the time they give him the Norris. He had a great uh CF percentage, uh, 53.2, meaning his team possessed the puck of way a pretty good margin more when he was on the ice. And his yeah. plus minus was actually one to be pointed out because it was a plus 22, so that's a very good plus minus. Once you get over like a plus 15. Your plus minus could be pointed, especially over a plus twenty. That's a pretty good in comparison uh, to the rest. Of yeah. The team too. So uh, yeah, especially in, I was going to say, especially in comparison to the Preds. So um, I think I give it. I'm giving it to Yossi. But again, Carlson and Yossi is one of my favorite players uh, ever as a defenseman because of how much he controls the game. Carlson even was saying that's like that. Like well, then, I, then throw yeah. in the fact that the best defenseman in the league, as far as I'm concerned, Hedman is there. Like he's the he's the best defenseman in the league right now, even more than Yossi. I mean, I, that guy controls every zone better than anybody in the league, as far as I'm concerned. But you know, unfortunately, I just don't get it. Such an you. offensive team, his whole team is so good that it kind of takes the shine off of how great of a defenseman he really is. In which case, Josie, if you put Hedman in Nashville, he'd probably get it this year. It's just the team in front of him. Right? That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Hedman, Hedman, I think, is 
going to be out this year on it. Uh, he also, of course, won one. I think Yossi, Yossi didn't win one. Um, and then Carlson, of course, didn't win one. And both of those guys are at the age of 30. So, so that's kind of Yossi's the second pick. He's a deserving yeah. pick. And, uh, yeah, he's, he, I think he'll likely get it. Now, Carlson's a guy uh, we talked about the Olympics, uh, not to go too off track, but with uh, Steele for a, with the podcast, we had him on a little bit when we were on on your channel, uh, Pirlo. And Carlson, of course, is definitely going to be a guy that would be a mainstay on Team USA's defense, hailing from Massachusetts. So, Especially on the big ice surface, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, he's a guy that definitely, even uh, at 32, he's a guy that seems to actually get better, um, like I said, as he ages. This has been his best season on both ends, so I would think he's going to be fine at least until his mid-30s, and he's not going to be in his mid-30s in two in two years in the Olympics, so uh, he'll only be 32, so I right. think we have some good things coming from him, but anyhow, um, we can move on to the big award for our locale area, which is our Selkie nominees, which of course include who I always joke that this award is going to be named after, after he retires and they're just going to get rid of Selkie, but it's not going to sound so sweet unless they call it the Bergie, I guess. Um, but Patrice Bergeron's been nominated for the count them ninth year in a row for the Selkie award. Ryan O'Reilly's been nominated again, well-deserved by him. Uh, I put him in my top five centers heading into the postseason on my pub sports radio article for if anybody wants to check them out they're a great site uh support them they do great things as well um and uh obviously coots coots is a guy that got nominated in the selkie who is a guy that like i said av coming in his system worked so well it finally got coots some um, in the selkie and you finally saw the flyers who the NHL sometimes tended to not give love to in awards, throw them th guys in two awards with AV for the Selkie. Well, three, because uh, Oscar's in the Masterson. But uh, I'm but the awards, uh, you throw uh, all those guys in there, and that's uh, very, very great to see. So who do you think you're giving the Selkie to? It. I, I'm not giving it to Bergy. Bergy's been there, done that. Need some new faces. So I'm kidding. that's just not happening. But who do you think you're giving it to? Well, that's why. Yeah. Could, that's really why. I mean, Ber you could give it to Berger on every year. He's the best defensive center of this generation. Mm -hmm. Maybe Datsyuk. You could put that up there. I mean, there's lots of there's some guys, but he's he's just on another level as far as a two way centerman in the league is concerned. Definite first. Ballot Hall of Famer, amazing player, love, love, love. But uh, and the league likes to mix things up, and he's just not that much better than a lot of other players. And they also like to have uh, new faces for people to celebrate for a lot of reasons. And uh, I think Coots is a guy this year. Um, or with uh, O'Reilly didn't really have the offensive numbers this year as he did before, I believe. And, um, yeah, he was a good defensive player, no doubt about that. But Coots has put in his – they like to give it to guys that have put in their time. And he's put in their ta his time. And he's been a great two-way center for quite some time. And it's really just feels like the time to give it to him. And uh, good for him. He's freaking awesome. I love him. He's great. I agree. I agree. And he's going to become another staple hailing from Arizona <laughs> of our uh, Olympic team. Uh, so – Another guy that's going to be a big guy on a Team USA Olympic team. And he had uh, – O'Reilly played great this year, and I love him as a player. But compared to all the people in the Selkie, his defensive numbers were actually the lowest th this year compared to everybody else uh, with his offense being the lowest. So that's why I would say Berge would probably play second, and then it would probably be O'Reilly placing – third and then I would think uh Cooks, I agree, is going to get it this year. He had again at a plus minus that worth that's worth mentioning because it's over a plus twenty. So a plus 
minus of 21. His Corsi 4 is a 57.2, and his career average is a 51.9. Mm-hmm. So that that's a massive jump. Um, and his career average, which uh, the offensive zone start percentage, which for people that don't know is offensive zone faceoffs divided by offensive zone faceoffs plus defensive zone faceoffs, is a 51.3. That almost went up 10 because his career average was a 43.2. So even looking at all those analytical, a couple of those analytical stats that I know all the voters love looking at, that would really favor Couturier for how much he jumped uh, from all of his career averages in those as well. Right. And uh, again, another reason I, yeah, well, no, I can't say that. Um, You can give AB a lot of credit for that as well, but I mean, Couturier was always up there, has, has been up there for quite some time. Uh, People, I just love, Couturier, and it's time to for him. For uh, I think it is time for him to be celebrated because uh, he's he's worked hard to get those offensive numbers that he has. Forget about his defense. I mean, he brought his offensive game with the uh, after the defense almost. Like he he worked hard at his offensive game, and that's rare. Bergeron was more of an offensive player, and he and he was good defensively, and he became a great defensive player. Couturier was a great defensive player, and he's become a great offensive player. And I think that's something to be celebrated because it happens rarely in this league that a guy works as hard as he does to gain his offensive game. And now you, you get, you've got a guy that can play against everybody's top line every night and still put up a point a game. That dude deserves a selkie, at least one in his career. I imagine it will be more. But it might be a little difficult to beat Drysaddle in the upcoming years, so that's going to be the difficult thing. They're going to be, uh, yeah, they're going to be guys um, that play really well. Because I know when Drysaddle came into the league, uh, when I was reading some articles, some of his comps were to um, a guy that I uh, always liked over at the Kings. Obviously, he doesn't skate as efficient as he does as he used to, but um, Kopitar who was up there for Selkie's young in his career. So, um, and even in some people's voting, when I read articles, was still in the top six or seven of their voting for this season. So, um, depending on who you looked at. So, there was um, there was a lot of stuff on his comparison, and that's uh, that was a good comp. And obviously, if you get... And I think Dreisaitl, because of his... Um, ridiculous athleticism that Kopitar had, but uh, I think Dreisaitl even as a notch up probably wouldn't have that decline a little bit quick where, although we did see Kopitar step up and play pretty well this year on a depleted team. So I do have to give him props for playing pretty solid this year. Um, Some of his metric stats don't look great, but like I said, he's on an awful team. Um, So that's going to play into that. Um, he played pretty well for playing on a absolutely downtrodden team this year. So, yeah, for sure, Kopitar. Yeah, I mean, and look what happened at the end. You could make a case that it might have been better for LA to make the playoffs rather than the Montreal Canadiens. Really, I mean, they the way they played at the end uh, at the end of the season, uh, they looked like they were a pretty strong team, and Kopitar is certainly part of that. Drew Doughty, they got a lot of veteran. I don't think that rebuild's going to take as long as people think. No, because they're not going to be able to trade Kopitar, so you're going to have him there no matter what. Um, even if you wanted to try to move him to save money, you're going to have to do a lot of um, negotiating with someone else in order to get that done. So I don't see that happening very not easily. That, he's got a no movement clause. So yeah. He want to go, he's not going yeah. Also, you could have to do a lot of negotiating with him. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a uh, thing going forward. But I agree with you. They're a team. If they hit this draft really good too, um, they're a team that definitely might not take as long as some people think because it also depends. Obviously, how Cal Pedersen, Calvin Pedersen. Um, continues to develop. I, I do too. Uh, I brought him up in my one goalie tandems uh, video because quick might not be the normal quick, but again, contract. If you don't want to buy him out, you ain't trading him. So he's a great role model, a mentor for a young kid. And that's what you're going to have. 
with Jonathan Quick there with Cal Pedersen. And I think Jonathan Quick is also a guy that's not going to make a scene out of not getting a lot of games if Pedersen. I don't think that's his personality. I never got that from you never heard anything about him being an issue ever. So I would say that uh, that works out perfectly. Hesitated but, there in a second. The yeah. Seconds. Yeah. Okay. So where are we going now? Or are we, uh, do, do we have one more? No, uh, I was going to save all the other awards talk because if we do one with steel, obviously we got the heart uh, coming out uh, tomorrow. Then we can get some of uh, steel's opinions uh, quick. If he disagrees with us on some of our stuff, then we can get good talk going and all that. So I figured I'll leave some stuff, but this has been a great episode. We kept it at a great time, too, at like the 45-minute mark, too. So that's a pretty, pretty time. Um, yeah. Yeah, we did a really good job. So we thank everyone for joining this edition of True Philadelphian Sportscast, the grittiest take. Pirlo, do you have BPAL picks of uh, follow mm-hmm. format and then your pure pearls of wisdom your pirlo wisdom youtube channel correct yeah and my nhl pearls of wisdom on youtube you can come see uh some fine stuff we're doing over there we're talking about a lot of trades and i like to get everybody involved if you like to uh comment in the comment section i'll put it in videos because i think you guys have some great hockey minds out there as well and uh like and also uh b pal picks is where my bread and butter is, and we do uh, gambling picks. We help people with uh, picking and investment as well as far as uh, picks like that. A lot of the people, our customers do not even follow sports at all. They just are part of us because of investment purposes. So you can find that on Patreon and also on YouTube, Be Pal Picks. Thanks for having me, man. This has been freaking awesome like usual. Yeah, yeah, we appreciate having you, man. It's been very, very awesome. And like he uh, said, this has uh, been very great. And this has been True Philadelphian Sports Care, the grittiest take for Pure Law. I'm Joe Borg. You can find me at JJBorg26 on Twitter, true underscore Philly Sport on Twitter for our podcast and for Instagram spelled out True Philadelphian Sports Care. Have a great week, everybody. Peace out.